share. Thank, thank God for that. <laughs> or else I'd be standing up here for 25 more minutes babbling. But um, I, I have some things to share. For one, I want to apologize for the things I have to share to the teens because I'm just coming out of two quarters teaching, teaching the teens and a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about are going to be a, an echo of what they've been hearing. When you pull somebody out of, a, out of a class when they've been focused on something for so long, it's just, that's what you're going to end up hearing. You're going to hear a lot of those things. But a lot of this also has been me as, as one of the, the missions deacons with, with uh, Scott Crockett and Judd Scott uh, preparing and focusing on missions. I've been specifically th putting a lot of thought into our, into our returning aimers and, and uh, returning missionaries coming off of, off of the field after, after their experience. And I've been reflecting back on, on uh, my time of, of transition in that. And I've been thinking about some things that I would like to share with them. And also, how to prepare the, the congregation, sort of, to get into the mindset of, of what they will need. So that's a portion of this. However, I, I do think that a lot of what, what I'm going to try to convey in the next few minutes um, is highly applicable to each and every person in this room to their own life. So before I get into that, let's, let's bow in prayer uh, for this lesson. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Father and that you are our Father uh, that greets us with open arms no matter where we are coming from in life, uh, no matter who we are, when we come to you, you rejoice and you come and meet us on the road. Um, and you uh, have rich blessings waiting for us at every opportunity that we choose to come to you and sit at your table. And we thank you that, that you have uh, given us freedom and have given us life, uh, but you haven't left us to choose or to or to have to figure out this life and those freedoms on our own. But you have given us direction and you have uh, given us a map to, to wonderful and amazing gifts, uh, to a wonderful and amazing purpose on this earth to, to glorify you and to bring light to your uh, magnificence and, and to make a banner of your name so that the whole world can see uh, that there is something eternal uh, about your creation. And it's not what we can see around us, but it's the spirit that you have put within us. And we pray that, that this can be a time of growth, that we can be focused on your word, and uh, that, that you'll be with me as a speaker, that I can convey this in a way that is understanding and uplifting for the congregation and the people here. Um, and pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So... Uh, reflecting back, as I was saying, to, uh, to coming off of the mission field, there are some, uh, some obvious things that, that anybody would be able to understand. There's the, uh, often the talk about culture shock of, of being in a completely different place, a, a different culture, the different foods, a different climate, the, the different way of life, the different way of uh, getting around that people have to deal with. And that's usually held up as the most significant uh, thing that people have to deal with, that, that eventually they will transition into, into life in this new culture, and, and after several weeks or a couple months, it will, it will be uh, taken care of. Um, there's a feeling of, of homelessness, of, of feeling like you have, you've embedded yourself so much into something and you have to get up and, and move somewhere else. I'm sure we have military families in this room that have gone through that. We have people that have gone away to, to college that have had to experience that same kind of thing. Um, there's a, when you leave a, a very distant foreign country, something that, that you need to understand about these young people when they come back is, is really there's a mourning process that will have to be going on. Uh, there are lives and, and relationships that they had with people that essentially, I mean, um, essentially have been, have been cut off at whatever point, suddenly, instantly, every single one of those people that are on the other uh, side of the world are, are gone. Technology is, is assisting with that, and I hope that that will be something that will be able to, to dull that, that pain for, for our young people coming back. But 
the thing that I believe is the most dangerous and the most significant uh, is something that we all experience, and it's something that I can only describe as, as purpose shock. Um, in, in contrast to culture shock, where, where culture shock is your surroundings and, and the people around you and the way you do things, but purpose shock is, is when you are on the mission field, everything is clear. What you are supposed to be doing is clear. Who you are supposed to be talking to in this day is is clear what you are going to do tomorrow and why you are doing it and the people that you're going to be doing it with. You have this purpose and you have this goal in mind as you're working through things. And it's so intense and you focus in on that so much that when you get to the end of it and you pop out the other side, you're just out into this smoke and you're alone and you don't have your team with you and you don't have the people around you and you're left trying to answer the question, what do I do now? What am I supposed to be doing? I say that this, is, uh, that this is dangerous. It's also very, very human. I want to very quickly break away. I don't want to spend the whole time talking about uh, returning namers. But this is something that we all deal with. Uh, and it's amazing how human this is. I, I want to summarize something, something briefly here. Noah, chap in Genesis chapter 6, was seen by God as somebody who was, who was uh, righteous. He was, uh, he, it says that he found grace in the sight of God. Everybody else in the world was described as being full of violence. The earth was full of, full of corruption. Um, God was so displeased with the actions of mankind that he said he wished that he had never created them, that he was going to destroy all of them. But one man, and it's only described as Noah. We don't even know what God's opinion of his family directly was. He ends up saving his family along with Noah. But Noah was found to be righteous, the one man on the earth that was found to be righteous. And God comes to him and says, here is what you're going to do. Here is what your purpose is going to be. Because of your righteousness, because of the things that, that I see active in your life, I'm going to give you a purpose that's going to take you 100 years to accomplish. You are going to put this type of wood into this type of form using this type of glue. It gives them the, the specifications down to the minutest detail of the, of the hard work that he is going to have to accomplish, the things that he's going to have to do in his life. And Noah being the strong, righteous man that he is, stands up to this task. He says, yes, this is something that I can do. Give me blueprints, give me a plan, give me, give me a description, and I will work hard for you for 100 years. I will work on this. I will, I will work till my fingers bleed. I will, I will work even though everybody around me says that I'm ridiculous and stupid. I will work on this. He works for 100 years. He gets to the end of his work. He has a boat. God fills it with animals. He closes the door. God closes the door. Forty days, forty nights, there is a flood and a rain on the earth. Um, I think it's important that we point out the fact that there were days and there were nights, and this man worked both of them in this boat, taking care of the things that God has given him to take care of. He was diligent to his task. Finally, the rains subside. His, the ark rests onto the top of the mountain. He passes out the, the birds. He gets the sign that, it's, that there's dry land, that there's growth and vegetation, that he can survive with his family. They open the door. They step out into the world. They see for the first time the eight of them standing there. They see a rainbow indicating that God is pleased with what they did and he promises to never do it again and never put them through that kind of torment and hard work and labor like that for another time. He builds an altar, sacrifices to God. And then Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine, and he was drunk, and he became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Shem and Japheth took a garment, and they put it both on their shoulders, and they went backwards, and they covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away, but they did not see their nakedness. 
closes off the story talking about him, and we move on, and that's the end of Noah. Noah! Noah! What? What happened? For me, this is proof of the fact that this is a true story. You can look into science. You can look into, into all of the evidence of the fact that there was some great flood. You can look into the, the proofs of, uh, of the word. You come to a point where you show me a man who worked hard for 100 years and gets to the end of it and comes out and says, yes, I have fulfilled my goal. I have achieved what I set out to do. And who knows how long after this this is that... He becomes a farmer. I guess I'm supposed to farm things. Maybe I'm supposed to grow some grapes. Flash forward a few years, and the man's naked, drunk, on his sofa, having to be covered up by his sons. The rebuke isn't towards Noah. For some reason, I don't know why. He ends up being mentioned here in, here in the Bible. Hebrews 11, in the, in the roll call of faith, as, a, as, a, as a, a man of faith and a man of righteousness. But a man who lost sight of his goal. A man who felt, who, who had apparently a short-sighted vision of, of his purpose. He did not have an eternal purpose. He had a temporary purpose and he felt that he had achieved his goal. And in feeling that he had achieved his goal, he completely mess things up. Who knows what the fruit of this uh, fault was. The purpose of salvation for Noah wasn't just so that he would be saved, so that he would be the, 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 the root of this, of this seed continuing. Ham, who, who falters in this, goes on to, to bring about uh, horrible generations of, of people and, and sin in the world that if Noah had just recognized his purpose in that, uh, he might have been able to prevent. We see numerous examples of this throughout uh, scripture, throughout uh, a spiritually and a secular world. I think about, about teens when they, when they graduate from high school and they go off into, into the world, and perhaps they were, they were diligent Christians while they were in the youth group, but what happens when they leave? I looked up some statistics. Everybody likes to look up and quote these statistics. I don't know why. It seems sadistic, but the, that uh, somewhere between uh, 50 and 80 percent of, of youth, when they, when they leave and go off to college, end up leaving the church. That's not the church specifically, that's denominations. Um, on a whole, I like to think that, that we are different from that, that our numbers would not be quite so bleak. It goes the other direction too. I see, I see a, a similar trend with uh, parents of youth. Once, once parents who have been so focused on raising their children and so focused on taking care of uh, what God has given them, and they see that as their purpose and their, and their goal for that period of their life, and then they get to the end of that and they've achieved something, and, and, and they're not really sure what to do after that. And we see these, these uh, older Christians with, with strength and knowledge and, and potential uh, experience in having raised children, and, and they, they sort of kind of fall to the wayside and aren't really sure what to do. And they become perpetual parents and kind of overparent their children sometimes. You know, and they, they have to struggle with, with what, what am I supposed to do at this point? Here you're looking. <laughs> they come back from AIM and they send them upstairs to sit on their bed as punishment. I'm sorry. I just saw the Kennings kind of cringing. <laughs> I went to school, I don't want to completely overblow my examples here, but I went to school with, with students in engineering school that I, I knew full well were never going to ever work as engineers. They were the best students. They were the absolute best students and I knew that they were completely unemployable. They would become grad students and then they would become doctors and probably professors. Who knows where they will actually end up, but they are perpetual students because they have no idea what they're supposed to do other than be students. That is their purpose. They are there, and they are locked into that. So what is the solution to this? 
How do we, how do we find what, what we're supposed to do in this next phase of life? Uh, the answer, of course, is to have a, a bigger perspective. It's to, it's to see beyond. I keep referring to the eternal purpose because it's in contrast to these temporary goals. An eternal uh, goal that we, can, that we can look beyond this, this life and the moments of, of everyday life and the, and the physical things that we have here and to look to something spiritual that goes on forever. Uh, if you ever feel like you have completed your task, your task was not correct. Um, Something I skipped over in my, in my examples is people who are so focused on, uh, and, this, and this is something I struggle with, you, you, you're focused on trying to support your family, and part of supporting your family is to have a job, right guys? And you have this job to support your family, and then you're working so hard to, to take care of your family by working on this job that your job becomes your, your, your purpose in life, and then your purpose in life being your job totally takes over and your family falls away, and then all of a sudden you're stuck here with this job and you're not really sure why you're doing the job anymore even, right? And if you, if you don't have the, the deeper uh, perspective, you will, you'll get trapped in that. Uh, you, will, you will get torn up into into thinking that your purpose is something that is temporary, and then you will be lost when that purpose is accomplished. I want to give you two quick examples. The first is in Luke chapter 5. Right, guys? Like, totally. This is just my review from every first 15 minutes of, of class every day. We're going to look at two examples quick of, of Jesus approaching people, finding people who are diligent in a purpose, who are <coughs> going in a particular direction and have a particular goal, and then he takes them and changes them and says, here's what I want you to do instead, something that is bigger and something that's eternal. In Luke chapter 5, it's Peter. I will read these 11 verses for you. So it was as the multitude pressed about him, being Jesus, to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from, the, had gone from them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitude from the boat. And when he stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and they filled the, both the boats that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' Jesus's knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon and Jesus. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. I like this example for lots of reasons. I think... It's amazing to see what Jesus does in this situation. This was not just some, some casual uh, happenstance. We know that Jesus had, had a great plan for Peter. And it wasn't that, that he just kind of glanced over his shoulder and said, oh, here's some fisherman here. Maybe I'll recruit him to come along. Jesus had this planned out in his mind. He knew what he was going to do. He knew exactly how he was going to do it. He knew how he was going to persuade Peter, the perfect way to show Peter that what he was doing was, was not significant that there was something more significant, that there was something greater that he was going to be working on. And this is the way that he chose to do it. There was nothing wrong with what Peter was doing. Peter probably was very happy and content with his life. He was probably a man who was very well respected. He had a job. Uh, this wasn't his own boat. He was a part of a company of boats. And it was... And, it was their job to go out and catch fish and to bring them in and sell them. And it is apparently a pretty good business. They had 
uh, numerous employees outside of the family. They had, they had multiple boats. We can see from um, that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were with him. And we, and we see examples later in life that their family probably had a fair bit of wealth. Um, he was a respectable man. He was, he was a man who, who respected a, a teacher, probably a, a, a follower of the law. Nobody would ever have faulted this man for what he was doing and what his, what his uh, purpose was. Nobody except Jesus. But Jesus comes and he shows him, you, you're a fisherman? You think you're a fisherman? You think that's what you're supposed to be doing is catching fish? Let's go out into deep water. Let's go out here. And I'll show you something astonishing. Peter acknowledges the fact that they have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at the word of this man who is speaking, he's going to do it. They go out into deep water. I like to, to think about uh, the fish in this situation. I did a, with, with Ben Baker several, several years ago, we did a, a, a VBS classroom. Where, where we had the, the children pretend to be fish in this story. If you think about the fish, the fish's purpose in this situation was also honorable. Not get caught in a net, right? Avoid being caught in a net. That's your life. Your life is to not die in a net. It's basically all you have to do. Don't get be eaten by a bigger fish and don't get caught in a net. Jesus comes along and he asks them to do something that is completely opposite from what they think is their righteous and, and direct purpose. He calls them to climb into a net and to get pulled into a boat simply to be the example that will bring a man uh, to faith. And then he says, see, Peter, look at the example of what I just showed you. You're going to come with me now. And Peter recognizes it. He sees the futility of what he was doing. And he, and he, and he says, I'm going to back away from this and I'm going to follow Jesus. Very briefly, I want to summarize Another story. And I'll have some closing statements here. In Mark 5. In Mark 5, there's a demon-possessed man. When Jesus and his disciples get to the edge of the, the same seed, a different situation, a different time. They encounter a man who is, who is demon-possessed. You guys know the story. He comes crashing out of the tombs up in the mountains. Uh, he's a man who's, who the people have tried to chain, who cuts himself, himself with, with rocks till he bleeds, comes charging at Jesus, falls at Jesus' feet. And the spirits within him say, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment, you. Tor do not torment me. And Jesus says, come out of the man, unclean spirits. He casts them, gives them permission to go into, into pigs. The pigs run down the hill. They fall into the water. The people who are attending the pigs run back home. They tell the people what happened. Another man who, who had a purpose. His purpose was self-destruction. His purpose was, was absolute futility. Uh, it was destroying himself. And Jesus comes to him and says, your purpose is improper as well. Two completely different ends of the spectrum. And Jesus comes to them and says, what you are doing is, is short-sighted uh, and inappropriate. You're going to do something different. The interesting thing in this story is that when Jesus casts the demons out of this man, the man begs him to take him back onto the boat with him. He says, please let me follow you. The very thing that Peter was asked to do specifically and Jesus says, no, I want you to, verse 19, go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. He sends him away to go back to his friends and family and to tell about the wonderful things that he has seen. Completely opposite direction of, of what uh, Peter was asked to do. But they're both following God's will. Uh, and really, they're both doing the same thing. They're both communicating to the people around them of the magnificence of something that is eternal and something that is bigger than this physical world, that's bigger than the, than the chains that could bind you, uh, is bigger than, than, the, than this self-destructive uh, nature that we have. Even Peter's 
honorable position in life was self-destructive. If you go back and you can read Ecclesiastes to prove that to you. That if you are doing something that is focused on, on this physical realm, it will be temporary and it will, it will not fulfill your reason for being here on this earth. For the sake of time, I'd like to go to 2 Corinthians and close off where we began. <clears throat> For we know that in our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, and the house that is not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse four, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, clothed that mortality may be swallowed up in life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. We are always confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. We recognize that, we need to recognize that what we have here uh, is a physical and, a, and a, a mortal tent. And what God has provided for us is a clothing that is, that is permanent and that is eternal. Uh, that he has set us free from our chains, Galatians chapter 5, for the purpose of being free. That he has brought us to life like Lazarus, for the reason of, of us having life, so that you can be alive. All of our callings are not going to be the same. All of us are not going to be doing the same thing. It is promised to us that we are not going to be doing the same thing. Um, all of us are not going to be called from the same place. But we all have a purpose. God has a reason for you to be alive. He has a reason for you to, to be his, his child. Um, a relationship that he wants you to have with him and a relationship that he wants you to have with the people around you uh, so that his name can be glorified and so that other people can, can learn to glorify his name. I feel like this has been very, very quick, but I hope that this has, has encouraged you uh, to take account of, of your life. Reflect on what you are doing. Identify the things in your life that are, that are important, that are bringing glory to God, and to realize the things that don't actually bring glory to God, the things that distract you from that, the things that, that pull you away from that. Find ways that you can focus more firmly onto, onto God and on spirit. Uh, do it as, a, as an individual. Do it as a family. Uh, do it with whatever God has, has given to you to bring glory to him with. Uh, do it with, uh, with your job. Do it with your money. Um, do it with your household. Reflect on that. Um, if there is anybody who is, who is burdened and who is chained here uh, and doesn't know what their purpose is in Christ, it might be because they have not yet been clothed in Christ. Uh, as we have found here, the, the demon-possessed man in Matthew chapter 5 was naked when he approached God. When he, leaves, or when, when he leaves Jesus on the shore, it says that he is clothed and in his right mind. Um, God has, has a, a rich robe that he wants to, to wrap you in. When you return to him as your child, if you choose to do so, he will, he will clothe you in that. And the clothing that he gives you is his son. It is his... Um, the essence of his son's spirit that, that he will clothe you in. And we are clothed in Christ in baptism. If you have questions about that, we can answer those. Um, if you are somebody who is, who is a Christian and who is wrapped up in, in the distractions of life and in the temporary things, or you have, you have come to a point where you feel accomplished and you want to have a renewal uh, of, of your goal and vision, uh, come forward and we will pray for that with you and we will help you find your your uh, reason for, for being here. Uh, but if you have any of those things, please, please make that known to the church and come forward as we stand and sing.
out of my sickness into thy mouth, out of my want and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus I I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gain of the cross. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of our sorrows into thy womb, out of life's storms and into thy calm. I come, Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee out of my depths of ruin untold into the peace of the sheltering Please be seated. James, thank you. Appreciate that. And in, uh, in connection with that, we had no communication in this regard. Uh, our, our, we said our 1220 class was going to change today. We're going to look at Noah's Ark. We have a video to look at Noah, uh, aspect of Noah building his ark. And another thing that James was highlighting, uh, we still have room, and we need it on both ends, we still have a need to transfer some persons and families from the early service to the afternoon service. We've, we usually have above 60 in the afternoon, sometimes as much as 80, but we're still crowded in the morning, so we still could use families moving, moving to the 2 o'clock service. Um, we've decided uh, to uh, change our service for Christmas Day. Christmas Day is on a Sunday. The 21st of December is on a Sunday. We're going to have a 10 a.m. service with everybody at 10 a.m. And we won't have uh, Bible classes or, or meal that day or afternoon service. So we will have everybody together at 10 a.m. Uh, for our assembly. Uh, and then the rest of the day will be with your families. Uh, that's, what, that's where a lot of, uh, of people's time would be focused. Um, one of the reasons I'm getting up here is the elders are trying very seriously to, to shepherd the entire congregation. And there are several who've been pulling away uh, by not attending or by other struggles in their lives. Um, and we're very deliberate in trying to contact them. So over the next few weeks and months, we will, may need to bring names forward and ask for your help uh, specifically in certain people's lives or worse than that, let you know that some, that some might have chosen to say, no, I don't want to have anything to do with the church anymore. And we want you to know that too. So please be in prayer over this. Please be contacting people that you personally know or missed. Uh, it is very much a one another uh, work that we're about. And the three elders cannot and, and should not be the, the only folks who contact people who, who pulled away strongly. We really need your help in this regard. Um, so the person leading our closing prayer, will you pray for that as well? Let's have our closing prayer this time. Will you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for this another day to gather together, to worship you, to fellowship with one another, to strengthen 
to go out to the communities next week and to share you with others. Dear Lord, be with those that are not with us. Be with those that are struggling. Be with us and help us to talk to them, to encourage them, to show your love to them and have them want to come back to be part of your congregation and to be with you, dear Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the food that is going to be presented after this service. We ask that you bless it. We, dear Lord, we ask that you be with the AIM program, be with the military members, be with the missionaries that are out in the world. We know that they have struggles that we can't believe sometimes. Be with them, keep them strong. Be with us the rest of this day and as we go through the week, dear Lord. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Not too many extra announcements today, but we want to encourage everyone to get a bulletin and make sure that you look and see what's going on with your church family. If you are visiting with us this morning, please take time to fill out one of the visitor, visitor information cards. There should be one in the seat back pocket in front of you. And please hand that to one of the men in the congregation, especially if there's something we can do to assist you. We want to let you know that we're very glad that you're with us today and we hope you'll join us again. We're going to serve lunch as soon as I'm done. We'll serve up downstairs and eat in the fellowship hall and everyone is invited. So we encourage you to stay. Please look at your announcements lists. Uh, prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, so please be praying for these people in our prayer request, prayer request list. Um, Sandy Baldwin is doing well, recovering from surgery, and praise God for that. And um, Kathleen Godso has requested prayers for her co-worker, uh, Nina Gundluck, and uh, she has cancer, and, and she's been in remission, but that's returned, so I want to pray for Nina and perhaps through our prayers um, we got also, the Lord will touch her heart. Um, there are several others in the list who have been on here frequently. I won't go through all of them. We do want to remind everyone to pray for them and to consider that Amanda Beam and Chris Reed will both return from the AIM uh, mission field uh, this uh, coming month, December. Yeah, not quite December yet, in December. And we're going to have a special get-together for... Amanda, Chris, and Josie sometime in January, and they'll all be a chance to give a chance to um, tell us about their mission field, but continue to pray for them. On that note, if anyone ever has any uh, questions about missions program at all, or concerns, or want more information, feel free to contact myself, uh, Judd Scott, or James Smith for more information. If anybody has any questions about um, the funds, or the issues, or how you can get involved, please feel free to do that. Um, for missions donations, we ask that everyone uh, specifically use the little envelopes that are right back there by the office in that um, little brochure rack there. Um, rather than putting them in the collection plate, that would just be convenient if you can, or at least put them in the envelope for the missions envelope. Again, if anyone has any information or questions about that, feel free to let me know. Um, also, we want to remember Stephen Baldwin, who's still serving in Afghanistan. And there are several others uh, on the prayer list, Mr. Foss and Mr. Reichel, who to pray for. So please continue praying for these people. On our calendar, TNT today will be at the Reichel House, not the Shipley's. The Shipley's apparently are not feeling well. So TNT will be at the Reichel's house tonight. Boys will have snacks. Girls will have drinks. The holiday dinner uh, for AIM Camp Adventure to support AIM Camp Adventure has been changed from the 10th to the 17th. So that will be December 17th. Your bulletin is incorrect. Please make a note of that. That dinner will take place on the 17th. Um, again, please sign up to bring meals, right? Or is that all provided? It's all provided. So December 17th, that will be in support of the AIM Camp Adventure. Um, directory update, Chris Woods will still be taking pictures downstairs if anyone is not able to get their photo taken for their family um, the last several Sundays. What's that? It'll be, pictures will be upstairs. Okay, it'll be in the auditorium for today. So if you haven't got your picture taken, consider that. 
Kids Craft Day will be December 3rd here at the church building for ages 4 through 10. Lunch is provided. Um, there's been an insert in the bulletin uh, for more information, but please contact Karen Williams, Bonnie Burke Hardsmeyer, or Tony Freeman for information. And they are needing donations for supplies and materials for that as well. That's Kids Craft Day on December 3rd. Uh, are any other announcements that I missed? Robert. Well, good. God bless in that. Hope you have a safe trip. Hope you get settled well there. We received a note from the Bennett family. If you remember, the Bennetts and their friends were involved in a very serious car accident a while back. And um, they wrote a nice um, note of thanks for prayers and, and thoughts. Um, it's from Dan, Jennifer, Brittany, Brianna, Dol Donald, and Erica. If you recall, they had some serious health issues regarding to that, that accident and were pretty beaten up. Um, but they had sent a nice thank you card. I'm going to pin it on the bulletin board back there in the back, so please take a look at that. <clears throat> For worship services next week, uh, David Wolf will have the songs in the morning and Jake Collins in the afternoon. Chuck Sutton will be in charge of the Lord's Supper in the morning and Chafin Collins in the afternoon. Robert will be delivering our lesson. Um, devotional this Wednesday will be by Chuck Sutton. And um, Rocky's informed me that there's, if anyone's not available, there's a backup list, and, and you can contact Rocky for information on that. Cleanup schedule this morning will be the Sperlin and Sutton families upstairs and the Street and Williams families downstairs. If there's nothing else, then you are dismissed. <laughs>